So I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome to Mohammed Tajsar of the ACLU. Uh, and Mohammed is a staff attorney uh, at the ACLU of Southern California, which he joined in 2017. His work there has spanned a wide range of areas, including, very importantly for today's discussion, digital rights and government surveillance. Prior to joining the ACLU, Mohammed worked at a law firm where he focused on civil, liber civil rights and workers' rights. And prior to that, he was a law clerk in the United States District Court for the District of Nevada and a legal fellow at the ACLU of Southern California. He has a law degree from UC Berkeley and an undergraduate degree from UCLA. So first of all, thank you very much, Mohammed, for coming on the podcast to talk about this really important topic. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. So first question is, there's been a lot of talk about potentially using data from mobile phones to combat the spread of the virus. Uh, so for example, a special location tracking app could make it, at least in theory, possible to know if you've been in proximity to somebody who might uh, be contagious. In the United States, the discussion has mostly been about uh, doing this tracking using an app provided by private companies on an opt-in basis. In other words, you'd only be tracked by this app if you choose to download it and then run it. What are some of the privacy concerns that you believe this would raise? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question and one that I think is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, I think before I answer that question, I think it may be useful to actually step back and provide some context and really define what it is that we're talking about here. And I think most of the kind of technologically assisted tools that are being discussed to address COVID-19 um, fall into the broad category of contact tracing. So I'm sure people have heard this term a lot and it bears um, uh, thinking about for at least a moment, figure out exactly what contact tracing is and then to determine whether technology is appropriate um, as a mechanism of doing it. So what, what is contact tracing? It basically is a longstanding kind of public health technique that attempts to identify everyone a sick person may have exposed to may have uh, everyone that a sick person uh, may have been exposed to and then it helps those exposed individuals and in identify and evaluate their risk of contracting the disease and indeed spreading it further and then in theory it would result in some appropriate action taken in response to that information right so traditional contact tracing is typically done manually. So what that means is I you know, go to the hospital and I am diagnosed with a particular disease. And then somebody comes and asks me, hey, you know, where have you been? This disease is infectious. Uh, we need to know kind of uh, uh, with the potential spread that you have caused just by uh, uh, kind of living and breathing and doing what you do. And that kind of manual interview is typically conducted by humans. Uh, and is often quite slow, right, uh, for various reasons. What then is done after that interview is a, a team or an individual then goes out to all of the potential other people that you have contacted, say, for instance, your family members, friends, colleagues, and informs them, hey, you know, uh, Mohammed wasn't, you know, has this disease, you all might be at risk, right? So that's the, typically the, the, uh, the universe that we're talking about here when we're talking about technology, when we're talking about contact tracing. The question then becomes, can technology make this process better? Um, can it make it easier, faster, more nimble, particularly when dealing with a disease that itself is incredibly infectious and fast moving? And I think the answer to that is maybe, probably not, who knows? <laughs> to, um, and I think that's true for a lot of reasons, but part of the big problem uh, uh, with the kind of that model, there are sort of two, it seems to me. One are the privacy concerns, and one are, I think, the efficacy concerns, right? The, um, we're not really talking about efficacy here, but I think the efficacy of these tools depends on uh, not necessarily the technologies themselves, but the entire political, social, and healthcare systems that exist around the tools to be able to provide the kind of um, uh, uh, sort of medical health and social assistance that people need. Uh, in other words, if you don't have functioning hospitals, it doesn't matter if we're contact tracing because you can't get the care that you need if you determine if it is determined that you are in touch with somebody that was infected, right? So. Um, uh, that I think 
is important. That's the reason why it seems to me that the contact tracing is a conversation that um, the, the conversation about privacy and efficacy is one that I think is a secondary one to the principal question, which is, do we have the kind of healthcare infrastructure to be able to provide at scale the kind of services that people need in order to survive this pandemic? So. That's the context, right? Uh, the question becomes, okay, well, given uh, the proposals that exist with respect to technically assisted contact tracing, are there downsides? Are there risks? And how useful are they? And the reality is that there are a lot of downsides, a lot of potential risks, and it's not at all clear whether these proposals can actually perform uh, the epidemiologically necessary functions that an ordinary contact tracing scheme is designed to perform. Uh, and I think that's true for a, a number of reasons. Some, um, uh, the print, the, there are, uh, there are a couple that I think I'd like to address here that are um, that are important. That the, really the the key to the success of um, these kinds of technically assisted contact tracing um, uh, sort of proposals that you and I can talk about a little bit further is how widely adopted they are, and wide adoption is a function of trust. How trustworthy do people in the population feel when it comes to interacting with that system? Um, you can imagine in a manual setting, if somebody comes and interviews me and says, hey, you've been infected, where have you been? If I say, hey, go pound sand, I don't wanna talk to you because I don't trust you, that system's not gonna work. In the same way that um, that level of trust is necessary for a technically assisted system. If I download an app that performs this function, I need to be able to trust that that app is going to do the things that it's designed to do and not do things that are surreptitious and that are against my interests. So how then do you build trust with a technically assisted contact tracing platform? You do it in a number of different ways. Um, and uh, the principal way that I think you do it is by ensuring that the system is built technically from the ground up to ensure the privacy of individuals who use the system. If it is not, then you're unlikely to get the widespread adoption that's necessary for you to meet your goals. And I think that is really the, what's at stake here, is how can you build a system that is trustworthy enough to be able to serve the goals that you wanna serve? And then, the, and then you can ask uh, um, the question of okay, you know, how can we kind of configure the system in a way that that um, that sort of mitigates some of those privacy risks? And we can, if you want, uh, John, we could talk about some of those privacy risks because I think that there are, there are plenty. But that's the kind of overall kind of framework that I think is important when thinking about these systems. And, and yeah, just uh, just do you give a couple of examples of some of the privacy risks that you uh, are most concerned about? Sure. Um, so, so first, um, we talked about, or at least I mentioned voluntariness, right? Um, that um, it, you can imagine privacy is a function, it seems to me, of, uh, uh, of autonomy, right? When we talk about privacy, what we're saying is we want to preserve the autonomy of individuals and community members and not feel like we're being coerced into do, providing uh, information that we don't want to provide or doing something that we don't want to provide, right? So the first key principle, it seems to me, to preserve privacy is to make sure that the system is not compulsory, right? That is that you cannot force people to perform, uh, to be a part of a system because that violates their own sort of uh, um, autonomy and it inhibits the adoption of the system widely. Right, so that's critical, it seems to me. Um, second, I think people have to own the system and own the data that is generated, right? So information about my own health is information that I um, have a control, ownership, and sort of um, uh, kind of rights over. And it has to be the case that these systems have to allow people to make decisions about their data uh, and not uh, be systems that are designed to extract either surreptitiously or otherwise information from, uh, from people. So what does that look like in practice? So for instance, um, if I design a system that tracks my location um, sort of publicly, I need to be um, afforded the opportunity to turn off that location tracking um, as I see fit. So for instance, if, I'm, uh, if I went to um, uh, a friend's uh, home to pick something up, but I was full wearing fully protected 
sort of gear on me. And I was quite convinced that there's no way that I would have um, either contracted or infected somebody else. I should have the option of telling the application or the system that um, I don't want to share that particular information because I'm pretty confident that I wouldn't have infected somebody. That's an example of the kind of autonomy that we're talking about. Another system, another example might be don't share information when I'm in my own home, right? So turning it off at night, for instance, right? That's the kind of control that is that needs to exist in a technically assisted contact tracing system that you um, that I think can preserve individuals' privacy. There's sort of there are a bunch of other ones, but I, those are Good example. Okay. So let me, if, if you don't mind, let me ask a question about the compulsory a aspect. But what, one concern is with an opt in app for potential exposure tracking, I can imagine a scenario where in practice it becomes no longer really opt in. And what I mean by that, if, for example, many employers start saying, you can't work here, be hired here unless you have this app, then in a practical sense, it, it really no longer becomes opt in because it comes, becomes a hurdle that, that one has to cross in order to actually earn a living. Is that a reasonable concern? And if so, how should it be addressed? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a tremendous concern, right? I mean, I think, we, um, as I say, the kind of the voluntary adoption of these systems is in critical to their use, right? So if you don't have mass adoption at scale, and then you don't have the mass sort of healthcare infrastructure that can respond to the information gathered by the scaled up technology, then it, the system will fail. So so let's assume for, um, uh, for the moment that the system's only used by a small fraction of the population. There'd be no way for you to know, for instance, if I, if I use a sort of Bluetooth-based application on my phone, there'd be no way for uh, other people who are in contact with me who don't have that application or don't have that particular kind of technology um, to know that they were uh, potentially exposed to me, right? So the wide scale adoption is critical. When you uh, and then when you uh, if you force that kind of adoption on people, it is unlikely that they're going to trust the system and implement it and use it in a way that will give you the desired outcomes that you want to create. So then, how do you do it? How do you create a system that doesn't um, that is truly opt in? but that it gives people the trust that they need in order to really opt in and to be comfortable with what um, the system is designed to do. And I think there are a number of ways you could do it, right? Um, uh, there are a number of privacy preserving uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of design elements that you can adopt um, that, for instance, retain data in an encrypted fashion, doesn't leak data, doesn't use centralized authorities to store information, um, doesn't maintain sensitive information, like, for instance, location, precise location information, but instead uses other forms of data, um, doesn't identify data to particular people, um, only keeps data as long as it's necessary, destroys it when it's no longer necessary. There's kind of a host of different privacy preservation tools that you can use to build trust, right? But beyond the design, then you, can, um, then you have to also create a system that's auditable, right? Meaning a system that is, uses free and open components that allows it to be uh, sort of reproducibly built by others to kind of audit the system, to, to look through kind of source codes and, and the software itself to ensure that there are no uh, leaks in the system, that there are no vulnerabilities and things like that. The system has to be auditable by experts and by everybody. Um, in addition, you have to also sustainably develop the system, right? So funding all of the different categories of people and developers that create the system, ensure that they have adequate resources to, to be able to iterate on the design, to fix problems, make it better over time. It has to be a sustainable effort. Um, and Because uh, otherwise, you'll have like an outdated system that has a bunch of problems that nobody fixes, and you're stuck on version 1.0 when the world has passed you by, right? And then I think you also, this part is also critical, the system also has to publish benchmarks. That is metrics to publicly demonstrate that it's being either effective or um, or is useful to serve the goals that it wants to serve, right? And those, and that I think goes a long way to ensuring trust in the system, that this is not something that's being used for nefarious ends or for something that I wasn't told about, but in fact is being used in the ways that um, public health officials um, desire it to be used. So those are just some strategies designed to, to obviate the problem of compulsion and create a system that is based on trust and based on sort of voluntary participation.
Well, thank you very much. So I have a question now about government. I mean, my the previous questions we were talking about, you know, a, a an app, for, for example, created on an opt-in basis by a private entity. But but suppose um, suppose the government were to or a government entity were to attempt to compel people to install a location tracking app that would provide this sort of data to the government. Um, I can imagine that that would lead quite quickly to a, a Fourth Amendment challenge. Um, and obviously, you know, none of us has a crystal ball, but do you think in general that a challenge like that would likely to be, be likely to be successful? You know, I'm, I'm skeptical that it would actually, to be quite honest. I mean, I think there is a tradition in, um, uh, there are multiple traditions in the kind of U.S. jurisprudential system that I think make it very unlikely that a challenge to that kind of compulsory application or technology installation scheme um, uh, would raise. So the, um, there are two that I'm thinking about. One is a frankly, a long tradition of, um, that dates back more than 100 years um, that enables the government to enforce quarantines and to enforce vaccination and other medically, what, what other uh, sort of, um, other of what the government considers to be medically necessary schemes on individuals. Uh, and that tradition uh, uh, and the Supreme Court has weighed in on, on this question in multiple cases. Um, the, the principle that um, we can extract from that line of cases is that even though individual liberty is at stake when the government compels you, for instance, to install an app on your phone, that so long as the government um, uh, claims a larger public health um, need or benefit to it, that a reviewing court is likely to, to give the government wide deference in making that determination, such that, for instance, if you know, the state of California told us, you now have, everybody has to install this application on their phone because it's critical to, the, um, to ensuring an orderly reopening of the economy and to ensure that people aren't uh, unnecessarily infected, I think it's gonna be difficult to challenge that. Um, and I think the government's gonna be given the state of California will be given wide latitude to make that determination. That doesn't necessarily mean that's a good idea. That's just what I think the Constitution and the laws will authorize as a, um, uh, as a legal matter, then query whether it's, a, uh, it's the right sort of policy or normative sort of uh, thing to do. But I think that's one line of cases that I suspect will likely mean that those challenges that you described, John, are unlikely to be successful. I think the other is we, you know, we've been living, um, if I were to take, if I take this out of the uh, pandemic context and put us in the, uh, in the terrorism context, uh, we've been living for 20 years, basically, just short of uh, 20 years in a gl uh, global state of emergency brought by the 9-11 attacks and how the U.S. government has responded to those. And if nothing else, what we have learned from how the law has responded to that state of emergency is that, frankly, anything goes when it comes uh, to the government's say-so about what is necessary to respond to a purpo that purported emergency. That is to say that the government is often given, and indeed we've seen this, an extraordinary amount of latitude in making decisions in response to what it unilaterally claims is an exigency or, or an emergency. And that courts will uh, rarely second guess the government in determinations about what's appropriate in response to an emergency. I, as a, uh, having, having worked on these questions for a long time, the, and the ACLU for in, um, itself as, a, as an organization, having worked on these issues uh, for a long time, uh, is in deeply, deeply skeptical of that, uh, basic premise that, uh, that allows the government basically uncontrollable act power to conduct whatever it is that it wants to conduct in a state of purported emergency. But I suspect that that, um, that history, that precedent that we have um, uh, wittingly and unwittingly built over the last 20 years is likely to be to give additional re, um, fodder for a conclusion that a, uh, a compulsory Compul um, compulsion in the use of a technically assisted contact tracing program is legitimate. So that's what I would say. I'm, I'm skeptical that, that any such challenge would survive. Okay, well, here's, a, here's another question. Um, you know, the government you know, historically has been, uh, shall we say, reticent to part with data that once acquired, it, it thinks might be useful. And suppose a government entity were to get detailed location data through some sort of compulsory process or, or some other process, 
um, what are the risks that the government might later decide that this information was really useful for things like combating crime and therefore be uh, unwilling to deleted after the pandemic has passed. Oh, I think the risk there is tremendous. I mean, if, if there's anything that we have learned from the rise of data-driven policymaking, it's that uh, governments have a voracious appetite for data, particularly because the cost to storing information is frankly negligible now, right? The cost of analyzing information is really high. I mean, it's, it takes a lot of time and money to be able to, to analyze data appropriately, but it's really easy to collect it. And I think what we have seen both from all from the federal government all the way down to local municipalities is that everybody is eager to collect and eager to, uh, to figure out what to do with that information uh, sort of on an ad hoc basis, often without real consideration, usually without public input or stakeholder input. And so that, um, that is the context that we find ourselves in today, the context in which the kind of surveillance and data collection ecosystem in this country is uh, um, extravagant and largely unregulated. Um, and so we have to really consider whether the use of technology in, to, res, um, to address this particular pandemic is one that, will, um, that we can countenance in light of a history that has, is replete with instances of mission creep, instances of abuse of technology, instances where a particular tech that was sold to us to do one thing is instead being sold to us to do another thing. I can give you one quick example, um, and that's the use of body cameras and facial recognition technology, right? So body cameras uh, uh, on law enforcement officers were principally sold at, their, at the time when they started to become popular as ways to keep officers accountable, right? If officers had video cameras, you'd be able to see um, if, they can, if they engage in some form of police brutality, for instance, or sexual assault, right? Uh, and that's how that's what the public was told and the public went along with it in some sense and allocated a bunch of money and now cops across the country use uh, uh, body cams. But then when they started using body cams, it became increasingly accepted to use body cameras, not as a form of police accountability, but as a, a, a tool for criminal investigatory purposes. And that's when we saw cameras being outfitted with a whole bunch of different sophisticated technology, including facial recognition to actually serve investigatory purposes. So there was a bait and switch when we were, uh, people were told, no, we're gonna use these body cameras to keep officers in check, but instead, it, they have become surveillance tech, um, sort of uh, tools. And that's why, for instance, in California, uh, a recently passed law prohibited the use of facial recognition on uh, body camera footage, precisely because of that bait and switch. But you can imagine that also happening in any of these tools or uh, proposals that are being um, uh, sort of uh, uh, brought to the public's attention with respect to COVID. We really have to be cognizant of um, uh, of how these technologies and how these tools um, are used and place strict firewalls on them to ensure that they are not exploited in ways that um, uh, impact people's uh, rights and liberties. So here, so thank you. And so here's a, a related question then is, you know, we talked a moment ago about, you know, how the government might sort of you know, attempt to make incidental use of data that it had collected, you know, for different purposes. But even if the government doesn't actually have this location data, let's say tracking data in its custody, if data exists, you know, for example, on the servers of Apple or Google, and if the government knows it's there, won't that inevitably expose that data to downstream seizures for purposes unrelated to combating the pandemic? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that um, the 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 um, there is an interconnected web of problems associated with with um, the public and the private industries access to information about people uh, and uh, and having uh, sensitive information about individuals, whether it's location information, if used in a contact tracing proposal, or, you know, uh, healthcare information, having sensitive information just out there in the ecosystem is likely to result in, um, uh, in unauthorized, 
unaccountable sharing of that information, given how, uh, uh, given that both as a policy and as a technical matter, we do not have proper safeguards over information in this country, right? So as a technical matter, I think privacy can often be built, uh, is not caked into systems by design. And as a result, the systems technically leak a lot of information. They're not designed to store information. And then as a policy matter, we simply have a wild west here when it comes to data and data collection and data aggregation and sharing. There is no federal, there's no federal privacy uh, legislation that can uh, put limitations on, for instance, sharing of data about people by data brokers. Um, there's kind of an unregulated space where com private entities can do whatever it is that they want to do. And the public sector can sort of um, leech on to the work of the private sector in that way. And so I think we really have to be concerned about um, uh, about the how sensitive information about us um, will be exploited, not merely by the likes of Apple and Google and other technology companies, but how that information can often seep into and be used and exploited by um, government actors. And I think that is a real concern that all of us, I think, should share. So thank you. Um, there's a question just about the kind of global landscape. In many other countries where uh, the civil liberties protections that we have in the United States are absent, Government, of course, governments, of course, have far fewer constraints on tracking and other forms of, of data collection. If those countries employ uh, these techniques, uh, techniques that if used here would be viewed as very significant in, uh, infringements on civil liberties, and they start to see significant progress against the, the virus precisely as the result of this, uh, these sorts of methods, would, you know, would that create pressures to use those methods here in the United States and in doing so, um, create pressures that would tend to undermine civil liberties here. Oh yeah, I think absolutely they would. I mean, the part of um, uh, what we have in this country, as I say, is a extensive, robust, and complicated uh, ecology of surveillance capitalism that um, sort of uh, expl is designed um, to exploit data and make a bunch of money out of it through an interconnected web of, uh, of small and large companies and small and large government actors. Um, that is to say that, that there's a ton of money in data and surveillance and uh, crime control and all of the like. And that money has created obscene incentives for the use and exploitation of data in this country. So you can imagine if there are either successful or presumed successful applications of technically assisted you know, contact tracing tools, for instance, abroad, that the pressure to use them here domestically will be great and immense. And we've seen that already, right? There's lots of um, uh, sort of references to systems that are being, uh, that are being used and were used in China, South Korea, Israel, and other places, um, really without an adequate and appropriate understanding both of how those systems abroad were used, but also of how those systems um, uh, were uh, implemented in a broader uh, sort of social and public health context that is really not analogous to what we have in the United States, right? Um, but uh, given the sort of what I think are perverse incentives in the United States to really explo to exploit the use of data here, um, we're unlikely to see the um, the downsides abroad. We're only likely to see what are perceived to be benefits, and the the pressures to to uh, deploy those technologies are likely to be great. And we've already seen that here. And there are a lot of tools um, that are being uh, developed and are starting to be rolled out uh, uh, here in the United States without the kind of thinking um, and the kind of care that are necessary to ensure that these tools are going to actually be useful. Um, and that I think is a a real uh, problem and one that I think we should all be really cognizant about. Well, thank you. So I'd like to turn to an issue which involves um, the intersection of medical privacy and digital privacy. And there's been quite a lot of discussion recently about doing widespread antibody testing uh, and giving people who have antibodies for COVID-19 what's sometimes been called an immunity passport right. that gives them more freedom to work and travel. And let's put aside for the moment the question of whether in fact, you know, having antibodies 
you know, actually confers immunity or not, assuming for the moment uh, that, that it does. Um, of course, but it may, and it may not, of course. But if it does, th that implies um, that people who don't have antibodies would be disfavored under the law in terms of their right to work and travel. And do you worry that this approach would create a, a new, formally disfavored underclass of people? And what are the civil liberties concerns that raise? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I do. And the reason why I do is I think less a technology-based reason, but more a political and economic reason. That is to say that what we have seen um, just in the short amount of time that this pandemic, um, this disease has raged in at least the United States, is that all of the traditional structural barriers to, um, to health care um, that exist in the United States have exacerbated the disease's impacts on communities across the country. So that is to say, you are more likely to survive this disease if you are rich, if you are white, if you have access to medical care. That's a fact. So what does that mean if there is a widespread um, um, adoption of the kind of immunity passport protocols or the kinds of things that you're describing, John, what does it mean for the, those um, propo reopening proposals to be adopted in the country in which there is a, a stark differential con um, uh, uh, sort of access to the kinds of tools that will make antibodies available on a just and equitable basis, right? That what it means is that the people who are likely to get the kind of immunities that are necessary for them to go back to work are people who have access to the kind of treatment that allows them to get the antibodies. And those people are going to be people that are, um, that have the kind of means to access the social and political power to be able to give them uh, the, the health care that they need. And what will, what will inevitably result is a massive underclass of people who don't have those means, who don't have that access, who don't have the ability to, to take care of themselves and their families, and who are, uh, who are locked out from portions of the economy that they need to, be, to, to, um, to survive. Um, and it's kind of perverse, because at the same time that that might end up being what occurs, we are, what we have seen is that those people in some places are actually being forced to go back to work on the threat of losing their jobs in these states that are uh, opening, but in my view, prematurely. And so at the same time that there is a lo complete lack of disregard for their safety, proposals that, um, uh, that will reopen the economy based on immunities are likely also to exclude these people. So in either circumstance, the massive underclass of people who lack political, economic, and healthcare, who lack access to sort of the uh, uh, to the levers of political and social power are going to be screwed either way. And I think that is a, really a symptom of just persistent latent inequalities in the United States. Well, and and to, to expand on that, it seems that if there was such an immunity passport, um, you might imagine that that could create incentives for, for people um, who, you know, don't have the financial resources to just simply hunker down, um, you know, to actually intentionally go out and, and just, you know, get infected so they can get the passport because that's the gatekeeping. That's the, that's what allows right. them to work. Right. right? And, and of course, you know, if they did that, they would also be placing themselves and their families at risk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right. I think so that the, the pressures the, against the, the pressures are, you know, the, the kind of inequities are amplified in that context. Right. I think that that's absolutely right. And all that's just the kind of, I, I'd say social and political context that the immunity passport proposal finds itself in. Then we have to deal with the actual design of those systems itself, which I'm deeply skeptical of because those systems need, um, require a whole host of um, information and data about people and that require real thought in terms of how they're deployed. So just to give you an example, in order to develop an immunity pass, in order for me to get an immunity passport, let's say it's an application, I have to upload my own data to that system them. I have to, that system then needs to verify that I am who I say I am, that I indeed have the antibodies myself. Who knows how that will happen? And then it needs to make sure that when I do go out, that somehow, you know, I'm not just giving my phone to somebody else um, for them to use. And then that system also has to preserve all that information that it has, somehow interact with other places and, and uh, like, for instance, a, a, a 
a movie theater or a live sporting event. There has to be some kind of facilitated, facilitated exchange of information. Um, and it's not at all clear what the how to maintain um, sort of autonomy and privacy in that context and prevent the kinds of potential abuses that we were talking about in this conversation. So I think there are a lot of technical problems associated with that proposal, even after we resolve the latent social and political problems, which I don't think we're going to solve. Right. And that, that leads to my, you know, my last question here is, um, and you already uh, brought this up um, quite rightly, uh, there's a lot of evidence that the suffering uh, and the economic harms, um, the, the health challenges caused by COVID-19, those things are falling disproportionately on communities of color, communities with fewer economic resources. And when we talk about these sorts of potential civil liberties infringements, digital privacy infringements, and other concerns arising from the pandemic, is there a concern that those would fall disproportionately on those same communities? And how can those concerns be addressed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's, um, um, I'd say two things, um, <clears throat> two facts, two assumptions that we have to make here. One is we have to assume that the pro um, the access to technological tools to solve people's lives or to make things easier is an access that is mediated by power. That is an assumption that we have to assume is true because our the history of technology demonstrates that that is in fact true. So if you have an immunity passport system that's based on phones, then what that means is people who don't have phones are locked out. People who have good access to internet, for instance, um, are the ones who would be preferred in a system like that versus people who don't. Um, remote learning, for instance, you um, is, is creating a situation in which people, um, uh, students who come from wealthier backgrounds are more likely to be engaged in school, whereas those who have, who don't, who have maybe uh, child care or sibling care or family responsibilities are being shut out of the remote learning environment. So everything that we know about technology today suggests that there are differential impacts on the widespread adoption of a whole host of different technological tools in our society. So that's the first point. And then if you couple that with the data that is coming out as a result of COVID that shows it um, in plain and stark terms precisely what you're talking about, John, that the disease is impacting people of color and poor people at astonishing rates um, as compared to their uh, wider and more wealthier peers, what you have is a recipe for disaster. I think, right? So just in, um, for instance, uh, kind of reporting earlier this month said that the rate that um, uh, people in, Ch the, the rate that blacks in Chicago are dying as a result of COVID-19 is at uh, just about 6% higher than the rates of white people. Here in LA County, for instance, the, uh, of, uh, um, there have been something like 940 deaths or so. We have data around 860 of them. And uh, of that 860, 14% are African-Americans, but the African-Americans make up only 9% of the county's residents, right? So they're dying at a disproportionately higher rate. And that's true um, sort of across the board, across the country. So all of that to say, we have a unique problem when it comes to particular communities like people of color, like the elderly, like people who are incarcerated, who are uniquely exposed to the risk of coronavirus. And so long as these technologies um, are uh, do not attend to those um, uh, uh, communities, we're unlikely to be in a place where we resolve this pandemic for the good of all of us, right? If these technologies don't, for instance, address um, the principal epicenters of the epidemic today, which are nursing homes and jails, then they're not going to be able to be in, we're not going to be in a place where we can fully reopen this country and bring some real normalcy back because we will have the, the virus will continue to live amongst our elderly amongst the people that we detain in immigration prisons amongst the people that we detain in jails across the country so um whatever the technical solutions are whatever the technological tools are that we develop they have to be uniquely tuned to the least among us, because it is the least among us who will enable us to get back to the kind of normalcy that we all are craving right now. And I think that's gonna be really important. Very much, I guess I'll just ask if there's any, any closing thoughts that you'd have to offer before we wrap things up. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, in, we've had a conversation about technology, and I guess what I wanna do is end with um, one 
tool, one sort of um, reminder um, that uh, that doesn't uh, that I think will should give us some hope. And that is, given all of the problems associated with technology, there is in fact a way for us to do all of these things, to address all of these problems uh, in a way that it actually has a light at the end of the tunnel. And that tool is human to human contact. That is the, the, the kind of humanity associated with um, uh, the care for each other, both in the, inside the medical system, but also elsewhere, that kind of contact is actually the kind that is more likely to be effective in addressing this um, uh, pandemic than any of the technological tools that we um, are kind of thinking about or devising. So um, all of that to say, there is a real important place for manual contact tracing, for instance, contact tracing that's based upon interviews with human beings that bring comfort to those who are affected. It is one thing for, for me to receive a text that I may have been impacted, but it's quite another thing for an actual human being to call me so that and talk to me about why that's being, uh, that is a potential problem. And this is not just me saying this, this is like epidemiologists across the sort of spectrum are saying that there really is no substitute for human contact for kind of the, the the types of tools that have helped us get out of epidemics in the past and that th um, these things are potentially only real sideshows to the real solutions that will get us out of this and those real solutions are solutions based on people and of love and compassion and i think that i would like to leave us with a reminder that it is only us that can get out to, that can sort of bring each other out of this abyss. And it's not the tools that we hide behind. And um, I hope that that kind of comes across in the way that we think about this going forward. Well, I thank you very much. I very, very much uh, appreciative of your willingness to spend some time answering these questions. And uh, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it, John. Thank you so much for this opportunity.